Welcome to the Irish Farmers Journal weekly podcast. Hello and welcome to this week's podcast. I'm Thomas Hubert, news correspondent with the Irish Farmers Journal. Coming up on the show this week. Because it was so late, so we just put the nitrogen out as soon as we could and we cut back a lot because for two reasons, for protein number one, but because we didn't think the potential was in the crop, so there was no requirement and we just cut back as best we could and probably cut back on, on fungicides as well, just trying to keep the cost down as best as possible and kind of work out for us we were lucky. How did they do it? We asked the country's best malting barley growers for their secrets and... They can make every excuse you like, but their, their loss would have been in practical terms, in terms of loss opportunity, somewhere between 1.5 and 1.6 billion in real terms. Not mincing his words, New Zealand's Deputy Prime Minister explains why the legislation establishing Fonterra needs to change. But first, the winter is upon us and cattle are beginning to go in, so what have we learned from the terrible weather of the past 12 months? Irish Farmers Journal acting news editor Amy Ford looks back and draws some lessons with Chagask's head of dairy knowledge transfer, Tom O'Dwyer. They met at the National Fodder Update meeting in Tullamore on Monday. Uh, Amy, it's been a very challenging 12 months um, with, as you said, um, storms, droughts and so on. Um, I suppose looking back, prob- uh, the obvious one is that uh, there wasn't enough fodder on farms. Farmers uh, headed into last winter hoping that they'd get uh, a normal or even a slightly shorter winter. Um, so um, there wasn't, you know, uh, ref- uh, reflecting on it, there wasn't enough fodder on farms. Okay, so I suppose the one one big lesson is that we have to be more cognizant of the fact that you know we mightn't always get favourable springs, which will allow us get cows out to grass full time. We won't always get favourable growth during the summer, so we may need some fodder during the summer to supplement less than less than normal or less than required grass growth rate. So, the the big lesson is that uh, in terms of our advice to farmers and in terms of farmers making uh, planning and management decisions that they factor in the risk or the you know the, the possibility that weather could go against them um, and the last 12 months weather has gone against them on many different occasions um, and you know do, do we just ignore that or do we try and do things differently because of what happened and that's the question I put to every farmer what are you going to do differently in terms of fodder supply uh, in 2019 are you are you going to do something different okay and you, you also mentioned um, that on dairy farms the majority of them have what you I think you said inadequate feeding facilities um, and that kind of comes a cropper when we have issues such as drought mm. or prolonged winters when we can't get cows out mm. what needs to be done in that case then do we need to obviously dairy farmers need to invest more in better feeding facilities and in turn better housing or every every farm is going to be different so there's probably not one piece of advice that I can give uh, today but You know, a simple thing would be, you know, can you ensure that you have feed space or head space for every cow in your herd? And if it then happens that that you have to restrict silage, they can all eat the silage at the one time. So, you know, this winter, if you're going to restrict silage, can you do that? Um, Or if in the case of, say, bad weather in April or a drought during the summer, can you put out feed along one feed, uh, feeding barrier and they can all, the whole herd, the entire herd, can eat at the one time? Um, so what's, what the case, what happens on, on many farms in terms of uh, feeding silage is um, there's probably about 400 mils, 400 millimetres per cow. That's fine if you're, if you're putting loads of silage in front of the animals and, and they can eat ad lib. You know, they, they're eating 24 hours a day. So it, it, it works. Um, but in a situation as we've experienced in the last 12 months, uh, if, you're, if you're trying to either restrict forage on the one hand or allow for all the cows to take in uh, some form of a supplement at the one time, they all need to have adequate space to feed at the one time. And that wasn't the case on farms, with the result that farmers were you know, trying to put solutions in place on the fly, which, you know, when you're in a crisis, you'll do that and you'll make do. But it, it, it puts more stress on the whole system. You have extra jobs to do. You're splitting the herd. Um, um, you know, you're feeding an, some animals at certain times a day and more animals at other times a day. The whole, the whole process takes longer. Mm. So again, you have to ask yourself, is, if, as we heard today, the likelihood of um, 
more extreme weather events is increasing. The likelihood of having drier summers is likely to increase. We're likely to have more wet, wet weather in the winter time. If all those things, if, if the climatologists are telling us that that's likely to happen, are we going to factor that in to our farmyard designs in the future, or are we going to continue to design and build farmyards as we have to date? Tom O'Dwyer there from Moorpark with Amy Ford. Bortmalt picked this year's best malting barley growers at an awards ceremony in the Guinness Brewery in Dublin last week. Irish Farmers Journal Tillage reporter Stephen Robb was there, and he asked the deserving winners for their farming secrets, both cues but from different farms. Padraig Kyo of uh, the Bala in Escorty, County Wexford, you've been crowned the, the overall winner um, of the Malton Barley Excellence uh, Award in 2018. You're bringing the cup home to Wexford. Um, first of all, were you expecting this? Were you expecting to, to win to top the overall category? No, no, not at all. No, it was, it was a big surprise like to, to even be nominated, so I was delighted. And this is, this is your first year in the competition? Yeah, first year to go to Dublin, yeah. yeah. Um, you've been getting a tour around the the, the Diageo, the Guinness facility earlier on. Um, anything stand out at you uh, from what you've seen? Uh, no, I was just very interested, like the whole process, the way it's done, and um, their attention to detail, and they're very uh, they're very professional about the way they, they do it, and they're passionate about the way they. So I suppose uh, you're a molten barley grower, um, and this is ultimately where some of the grain is ending up. Do you think is it important for for growers to to actually see this process? Oh yes, yeah, very. It is. It is because they can explain to you some of the problems they might have if barley's not up to spec and the way they need. It. And it, it, their process is complicated as well. ours is, but theirs is complicated as well, like on their side. Okay. Um, look, it's been a tough year. It's been a very tough year, and down in Wexford was certainly a hot spot for the, uh, the I suppose the, the most intense, one of the most intense areas for for the drought. Um, but yet, your your averaging your molten barley it averaged around two point two ton to the acre, uh, and you said that your proteins um, didn't none of your samples were above uh, ten. Um, how did you manage that? What did, what did you do differently um, versus maybe some of the other growers? Um, I'm not sure if it's different than other growers, but we just, because it was so late, so we just put the nitrogen out as soon as we could, and we cut back a lot because we, for two reasons, for protein, number one, but because we didn't think the potential was in the crop, so there was no requirement, and we just, that's all really done, just just cut back as best we could, and probably cut back on, on fungicides as well, just trying to keep the cost down as best as possible, and it kind of worked out for us, we were lucky. Uh, so when, when did you sow the, the crops? We started uh, 29th of April, and I think we got a haul in by the 6th or 7th of May. Uh, you cut back on N, so I suppose where would you normally be in terms of uh, nitrogen fertilisation and where were you this year? We'd normally be around uh, 120 ish, depending on the fields and the rotation for spring barley, and we're back, I'd say, about 100 to 105 this year. And in terms of the fungicide uh, spend, I mean, it's been as a result of the dry year. It's been a fairly low disease pressure year, yeah. and you took full advantage of that. Yeah, we just—it's not that we didn't spray it. We just cut back on the rates as best we could because it was just disease wasn't the issue. It was more so um, just trying to keep the crop, crop alive. We put, we probably spent didn't really save much because we would have put what we saved in fungicides, maybe into trace elements and things like that, trying to just coax the crop along as best we could. I suppose this has probably been the toughest year that you've ever experienced. Um, what have you learned from this year, really, um, that you could possibly apply uh, going forward, or indeed, was there any real lessons from this year? It's not so much a lesson. Just you just deal with it. <laughs> just deal with it as best you could. Like um, I still think, if we had got the crops on a bit earlier, it, the drought wouldn't have affected it as much. It's just the fact is there are some fields. Hardly got any rain from the day or so to the day or cut, like, and that's that's not good. Like. So, uh, Philip Kyo, uh, yourself and your father Francis, you won the Seed Growers of the Year award. Uh, Philip, what does it take to, to grow an award winning uh, crop of seed? Well, definitely when it's involving farming, there's a lot of luck involved. <laughs> you're you're very dependent on weather conditions, to be honest, but like. Um, there's no secret formula to being successful in any farming. Uh, um, generally, it's like any other business. Um, what you put in, you generally get back out. 
we find maybe it's attention to detail more than one secret formula that that you can be successful in any crop, and uh, it's just watching the little things, like that land is dry obviously before you uh, sow, and it's the right seeding rate and the right temperatures and so on. Well, this year in particular, geez, we don't need to remind growers what what kind of a year it's been, and it was concentrated particularly in the south and southeast, and and Wexford was a real hot spot for 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 the drought conditions. Um, how did the 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 crop, I suppose, uh, react to that? Um, I mean, were average yields back? How did it affect other key specifications for seed? Yeah, well, to be honest, well, we we grow malt and barley as well, besides the seed. But we we had our toughest year in terms of um, being it was so unpredictable the weather. We've got as little. I think some of our crops actually got as little as fourteen mil of rain throughout the whole growing season. And to get crop establishment was our biggest worry because some some of it got no rain. So you're depending on the the natural moisture that was in the soil before you tilled it to to get the crop to emerge. But um, from a disease point of view, obviously without the rain, it was probably more beneficial. You could put, cut back on rates somewhat, but um, we were surprised that the, the grain filled to the extent it did with the lack of rain, and uh, we're grateful for that. We we probably averaged, I suppose, two thirds of our normal yield, which was very good for the year that was in it. That was Philip Kyo, the seed category winner, ending this report by Stephen Robb. With changes to the cap on the way and the ups and downs of Brexit negotiations, farmers are facing a lot of uncertainty, especially along the border. Last Friday, Irish Farmers Journal news correspondent Barry Cassidy was in Castle Blaney in County Monaghan to attend a farmers' meeting on the future of agriculture. He spoke with the local MEP, Matt Carthy, who organised the event. Crucially, what this was about was to provide uh, an opportunity for farmers from this area to actually engage with all those farm organisations and with the European Commission. And I thought that interaction was really useful because it gave us an idea of what people's priorities were. There's certainly a sense that you could get tonight of people feeling that there's an inherent unfairness in terms of the system, not only in relation to the power that multinational corporations, whether they be retailers or factories have, but also in terms of the payments and schemes themselves. And you saw quite a number of farmers who would be on lower payments, um, who but who work very hard and who are um, angry, I suppose, at the inequalities that are there in CAP. And I suppose we all need to take that message in my view. And I suppose then we heard from the DG Agri representative there, she mentioned simplification several times. And then we heard from our farm orgs who said maybe simplification isn't as easy as they make it sound. No, and I've I've never heard Phil Hogan, for example, giving a speech that he didn't mention simplification, but I've never heard him actually presenting anything in a simple in a simple way. And to me, and Martin Kenny made this point, if we're looking at you know, simplification of Pillar 1, for example, in my view, we need a strong definition of an active farmer and we need to have definitions for eligible land. And then what you have and should have is flat rate payments front loaded for the first 15 hectares in a very strong way and then perhaps for another 15 hectares in another way so that everybody benefits. And I suppose the thing about that simplification is the vast majority, vast, vast majority of Irish farmers will be better off under that scheme. And yet there's huge resistance to it. People need to ask themselves, why is that? And then after simplification, I suppose the other big word we've heard is sustainability and maybe comes from two ways, and that's income sustainability as well as environmental sustainability. Absolutely, absolutely. There, um, you know, climate change is very real, we know that. In fact, probably nobody knows it better than farmers. They've actually been at the brunt of a lot of the effects of climate change over the past number of years. So they know the importance of sustainability. Um, but they also need to be able to sustain their own families, their own lives. Communities need to have incomes to be able to um, manage domestic equality, um, equalities of life and all of that, that comes with. So there's there's a big onus on all of us and we know that going into the cap. And it's true and you can, I suppose, be flippant about these things. We all have a part to play in all of these things but we all need to be supportive of each other and we need to be especially um, supportive of those people who are putting in the most amount of work to produce the food that we eat Subsidiarity, that was the other big word this evening <clears throat> and that means basically that our member states are going to have more control over their own cap policies Yeah, I've always argued that the EU has too many competencies so of course I'm going to welcome any, um, a- any prospects of more powers being returned to a national level and I've I believe firmly that decisions should be made as close to communities that are affected by them as possible. The difficulties I have with subsidiarity is um, twofold. One is that it needs to be very clear, it needs to be upfront so that people know exactly what it is that the department are responsible. So we don't have 
this um, ping pong that many individuals and organisations currently have whereby the department are telling them that something is the EU's fault and then they go to the commission the commission says no that's determined at a national level so it needs to be very clear exactly where the demarcation lines are drawn the second fear I would have is that sometimes our own department makes absolute hames of things when they have power so I think whatever powers we have we need to ensure that the department are making the decisions about how to use them in consultation with all the stakeholders and that of course includes the farming community. Sinn Féin MEP Matt Carthy with Barry Cassidy. Stay tuned, after this break we're going to New Zealand. New ANC maps to include more areas. In this week's Irish Farmers Journal we reveal how farmers are set to gain from new ANC maps and increased budget for 2019. No fair deal changes until 2019. Over 2 million in fodder payments to begin by year end. We review the big variations in this year's potato yields. Vulture Fund backs down from farm sale. Four and five Kerry Co-op shareholders reject board plans. Plus don't miss your free 36 page Dairy Day guide inside this week's Irish Farmers Journal on sale today. New Zealand opened a new embassy in Dublin this week. Our agribusiness reporter, Larkin Allen, seized this opportunity to catch up on the big Kiwi farming issues with the country's deputy prime minister, Winston Peters. He's also in charge of foreign affairs, and Larkin started by asking him if Brexit was a chance for New Zealand's agri-food exports to the UK. The thing is that uh, New Zealand is a country of realists, and uh, we know how to deal with inevitability. We're getting ahead of it. Uh, that is, we're not waiting around until next March or sometime in the future. We are t- endeavouring to engage as hard as we can now with the European Union uh, in, t- in terms of an outcome of a free trade agreement with the European Union. And we're also endeavouring to engage with the UK, even though it's very difficult at this present time because there's not great clarity out of the UK as to where they're going. Or, for that matter, um, that there's a great deal of recent understanding of what free trade agreements and what trade agreements between countries look like. They have not had much of an outing for a long time in that area, and we've been out uh, trialled, so to speak, constantly around the world, doing to spread our uh, engagement and to engage in free trade agreements, the last one of which was the um, uh, very successful, comprehensive and progressive uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement which we were seriously engaged in. So that's my answer. We are trying to deal with inevitability and with this greater speed as we possibly can to get a high-value free trade agreement with the European Union and also with the the UK, however it turns out. In terms of that uh, trade agreement with the European Union, what... Where do you see the greatest opportunity for New Zealand exports into Europe? or What, what, what kind of products do you think that will benefit most from a, an agreement with the European Union? Well, we, we, without being too, uh, there, there being too fine a point, there's been serious protectionism in the European Union when it comes to agricultural products. But there is also an understanding that long-term this cannot go on. In, in a world of growing demand for our products, there, there's room for all of us. And that's what our message is to the European Union, and now that's what our message is to Ireland. We can sell at better returns our products together rather than to be competing against each other in some drive for the bottom as opposed to a drive for the top in terms of value. New Zealand is a very um, globally focused country. It's an open economy. Free trade is very important. What's your experience of the kind of growing fears of a global trade war? at the minute, are tariffs going on between China and the US. What's your sense of the world economy right now? Well, we have the um, clear understanding that we can't do much about it, but what we can do is, whatever its uh, effects are, to mitigate them against uh, our, mitigate them where they might harm our interests. Or well, dare I say, if you've got our eyes wide open, see opportunity where some may not see it existing. We don't quite know what it all means. Yeah. And it'd be a very wise man or woman who did. Mm-hmm. Finally, I, I just kind of wanted to get your view on. I know there's a, a review of the Dairy Industry Restructuring Act in the New Zealand, yes, yes. Dairy, yeah, yeah. which um, uh, was the foundation of Fonterra, I suppose. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, where is that right now, or what do you think you know the future might look like for Dira? You're asking a very, very, a very, very pertinent, very relevant question, which at this very moment, since this is only a matter of weeks old. Uh, we're having as a coalition government serious discussions on saying what we're saying is before anybody lands anywhere let's make sure that we're all agreed where we might land on this 
So it's an answer I can't give you. It's not. We've got the report. What we do with it may, is, is what we're working on now. But what, what is the reason, I suppose, for the review, or in your opinion, or what, why has there been the need to look at Fonterra again or the DIRA? What's the real reason? The real reason would be uh, imaged or evinced by its uh, latest uh, economic performance. Okay. It has simply not been nearly as good as it should have been. Uh, they can make every excuse you like, but their, their loss would have been, in practical terms, in terms of lost opportunity, somewhere between 1.5 and 1.6 billion in real terms. <laughs> now, uh, I suppose the other thing that more concerning about us was that the um, opportunity for uh, much higher added value performance was not taken. Uh, they, uh, they can't just um, go on as it were, uh, as we did in the past. And um, there's, without giving the game away or breaching confidential rules with inside the coalition, there's a whole lot more that requires serious consideration from us all. And the good thing is that there are people in the um, coalition government whose background is in dairy, came off dairy farms, who've never lost our, our sight of the need uh, to turn uh, our product uh, and our milk and other products into the highest added value that we can possibly turn their returns into rather than selling it bulk. Okay. Or this dependence, one product, milk, one company, Fonterra, one market, China. There are inherent dangers in all three propositions, and we are struggling as a new coalition government to come to grips with it, where the previous administrations most certainly did not. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your time. No, um, well. That was New Zealand's Deputy Prime Minister, Winston Peters, with Lorcan Allen. Now, what exactly is biological farming? A conference was dedicated to the concept in Tullamore earlier this week, and my colleague Hannah Quinn Mulligan was there. She asked Gary Zimmerman, an American farmer and researcher, how he came to promote a different type of agriculture. Yes, biological farming is a system of farming that we deal with the chemistry, the nutrients, we also deal with the physical properties and the biological. I say we're in a new century, we have enough information from people all over the planet on how to ideally or at least do a really good basis on balancing and managing the soil. I coined that term about 40 years ago because I wanted the farmers to focus on the biology and not just always the chemistry. And some people will be thinking the word hippie now listening to you, and so I'm sure some people were in the conference as well. But you do have a background, an academic background um, in dairying as well, don't you? And so for a lot of dairy farmers, I mean, what would be the news for them? Because in Ireland, people would be thinking very high inputs, high levels of fertilizer, that kind of thing. Yes, and I am a dairy nutritionist by training, and I got introduced to the soils when I was teaching at a technical college in Minnesota. And I realized well, how we took care of the soils and how we managed the nutrients in the soils and how we had these healthy mineralized soils affected the feed. And I always told the farmers, give me your dry cows, let me take care of those dry cows and get the right feeds grown for them. And then also the forages that the cattle consume. And so how we not only harvested them, whether it's mechanically or by cows, and then how the nutrients went on. I know you can get yields by pouring on nitrogen, but can you really get nutrient density in healthy cows? Nitrogen is always a lot of times an enemy, and that's why I did my graduate work on sulfur containing amino acids. So sulfur became a really big part of what we did to get cows healthy. So yes, I have quite a background in dairy nutrition, but I now work with almost any crop imaginable because healthy soils with lots of minerals and good balance grows any crop really well. But like, looking around globally, we say that the U.S. is pushing numbers in their dairy herd. We see Ireland is pushing numbers in their dairy herd. I mean, is that necessarily the right thing to do? Can we balance biological farming with expansion? And I think what we all do out here, every farmer needs a little more cash flow. They want to milk a few more cows. Uh, America's got some real issues because we've got all these mega farms kind of taking over. Uh, our, my family farm, and we also farm, we're organic, and we milk about 180 cows and farm 1,500 acres. We do some cereal crops and things in addition. Uh, to my whole thing, it's about profitability, and it's also about fun and having f and fun in farming. And uh, we're not going to chase sick cows around all day. And so we do everything we can to prevent problems and, and keep our, our profits in line. See, once you get those soils fairly well mineralized and you rotate fairly well and do some really basic, simple kind of things, you don't need to have those huge inputs. Being organic, you are, a lot of your inputs are taken away. You, you have no choice but to get those cows healthy and the soils healthy and the minerals right. And so the profitability doesn't necessarily come from producing more, although everybody's coined to do that. If everybody went to the system of farming I'm talking about, we'd have a shortage of milk and they'd all get paid for what they produce. But I know that's not going to happen. Volume, I think the consumer, the next 
steps in agriculture is that consumers getting behind this thing. The health issues are real. The food companies in America are getting behind. They want to have a one-up on the next food company by having more nutrient-dense foods, and they want to promote carbon sequestering in the soils. So there's going to be a lot of pushes coming along that, will, that hopefully will get rewarded for doing the things that they want us to grow and what they want us to do. So this has been a two-day conference that's just concluded here. I mean, what have your, been re- your reflections from the Irish farmers in the crowd or your, your kind of overall opinion of it? Well, I've been here before, but I said, uh, this is the rowdiest bunch I've ever been around. That bar last night was humming. I couldn't, you couldn't hear anybody. You couldn't hear yourself think. I can say that. I tell people I have a distorted view of the world because I come to these conferences all over the planet because I've written a couple of books that gets me around. And, yeah, there was a lot of really interest here. There was a lot of people that I think were beginners from, what I, from other places I've been and maybe more so. But I, there are some, there's some people here doing it. There's some people who are working with it. And everybody's got their excuses. Well, you're not from Ireland and all that. But its soils are pretty well the same around the planet we all got our issues but they're all quite different but the concepts and the principles are the same so i was there's a wonderful bunch of people here and they were i I think there's a lot of them are going to make some changes whether they do the mob grazing on their cattle whether they're doing vegetables and how they're looking at doing it i think there's some real steps going to be made from out of people that were here today and for anyone who wasn't here is there any take-home advice that you'd give them at home even if they're not into biological farming what could they be doing to fix their soils or look at their soil improvement Yes, I tell everybody you got to get a good soil audit and look at more than just N, P, and K, and you always start fixing soils by calcium and phosphorus. Phosphorus is a good guy. I need my available sulfur. So there's things we can do in a good soil audit goes a long ways, and I tell people they got to get themselves educated enough so they get rid of being the slave to agribusiness. It isn't about the next new chemical, the next new biotechnology. It's about prevention of everything. It's all about putting a system in place, whether it's your own health, your livestock's health, or your soil's health. I think there's a lot can be done on prevention. That was the father of biological farming, Garrett Zimmerman, speaking with Hannah Quinn Mulligan. For something totally different, let's join our deputy editor, Jack Kennedy, in the world of high-tech feeding and robotic milking at Eurotier, the big international trade show for livestock equipment in Germany. He met some of the exhibitors at the event this week. I'm here with Stephen Hennessy, Export Business Manager for Agritech in Nina in County Tipperary, and we're here at Eurotier in Hanover in Germany. Stephen, what's the key kind of objective of Agritech being here at the show in Hanover? Well, mainly, Jack, I suppose, look, it's a, it's a great showcase for the products. Um, as a shop window, you couldn't ask for better. It's an opportunity for us to sit down with our current distributors, meet their customers, talk about um, the products, um, and then it's also then about new markets. Yeah. Where else can we go? Exactly. And, and I suppose, where are those new markets, or where are you looking to for your products, kind of, I suppose? And maybe just give us a little, a little feel for some of the products that you're, you're targeting to those faraway countries. Yeah. Well, first of all, I suppose, UK has been a big market for us, uh, and we continue to work there, but we, we are looking further outside Europe. Um, so Middle East is a big market for us, so okay. into the big farms in the likes of UAE, Qatar, Oman, okay. uh, into Egypt, um, so all those countries in the Gulf. And um, the products that we would be going into, Jack, we have a product called Optimate, which yep. is a protected uh, omega-3 product. Uh, we do Roommate, which is our non-protein nitrogen uh, product. And then we also do, for monogastrics, we do uh, an omega-3 product as well. Okay. So, so that, that would be for mainly for fertility or yeah. omega-3 enrichment. Yeah. Isn't it amazing, like a company that, that's manufacturing and processing these, these products in, in Ireland is, is getting into these large-scale farms in Egypt? Like, I mean, there, there must be big competition in that market. There is big competition, Jack, but I have to say, even if you go to the likes of UAE, I'd say 50% of all the farm managers are, are Irish. So it just goes to show there's huge respect for Irish people and their knowledge of farming and dairy cows. So, yeah. And also then, naturally, it goes in hand that their knowledge in terms of making products and making products that work for dairy farmers. Yeah. So the Irish network is getting you into places where, where you know, where once you'd have dreamed of, of, of participating. You would, have, you would never have thought of Jack. I'm here with Edmund Harty and Dr. John Daly on the Dairy Master Stand and Euros here. Edmund, you, you've just picked up a um, silver award for innovation for Dairy Master Mission Control. Tell me what it's about. Yeah, so the Mission Control is uh, something completely revolutionary for rotary milking. So, uh, first of all, it gives you all the information at the right time. But more importantly, it's a little bit like 
dynamic cruise control for a car. So if you think about driving a car, you know, some drivers, they drive too fast. Yeah. Some people drive too slow. Yeah. And then if you think about d- dynamic cruise control, it goes at just the right speed according to the traffic. Okay. So that's what this does for rotary milking. So it controls the speed of the rotary okay. according to the individual cow's milking profile that's uh, on the platform. So what that really means is that uh, you have a performance improvement in throughput of between 20 and 30% on rotary milking. Okay. So it's a huge performance improvement. So okay. if you think of it like this, a 50 unit can do the performance of a 60 yes. with, with mission it's control and with, with a feature called OptiCruise. Okay. And have all dairy matter rotaries this now as a standard? Is, no, is this no? this uh, will be an option uh, available uh, on dairy master rotaries. Okay. Um, uh, it's like adding cruise control to a car and okay. it's like adding a sat nav. Okay. So it's something uh, that gives you additional information and additional control over and above what's normal. Okay. So we're, what we're really talking about is optimizing performance of the rotary. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it optimizes the rotary performance. So if you think about, we'll say, um, you know, if you stop a rotary, it'll regain the speed for you. Or if you think about when does when do cows actually finish milking? You really want them to finish as close to the exit as possible. And by doing that, you're getting higher unit utilization. So you're utilizing the units in the parlor much better. Some farmers talk about that to get to get optimum results from your rotary, you should have a certain percentage going around a second time. This will automatically, this will automatically calculate that, okay. it, and it's not any fixed percentage. Okay. It really depends on the cohort of cows that's on the platform at the moment. It's an intelligence that this, yes, that's, that you're bringing to rotary milking, like yes. yeah, yeah. I'm here with Alex van der Lely from Lely Systems in Holland. Alex, you've just launched a lean dairy farming book here at Euro 2018. What is the objective behind launching such a book? Well, our objective is uh, defined in our vision, sustainable, profitable and enjoyable future in farming. We want to bring, for this aspect, more profitability and sustainability into the business model of a farmer. And you can do that with technology, with the milking robot, etc. But also you have to look at your lean process, at the processes on the farm mm. and uh, draw them in, in principles that they keep on working and that you make less mistakes. Principally, Irish dairy farmers would, would know Lely as a, a milking robot company. How is that aspect of the business going, the, the robotic milking? Uh, robotic milking is going very well. Uh, I think worldwide we see the trend to robotics on a very high pace as people believe that this is the way to go to, to keep on doing the work. Mm. And in Ireland uh, you are of course fully on grazing, so the, the, the feeding is a smaller aspect. But the lean principles you still can apply to those those ones too. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of, we see at your road here some robotic rotary systems. Is there any chance that Lely would do a robotic rotary in the future? No, we no. will not do that because we believe we in our development we always put the cow at the center okay. and treat the cow well and design your systems around that. I'm here with Ian Lehiff, who is from, originally from Gort, County Galway, but now is the Alflex representative in China, based in Beijing. Ian, can you tell me, I suppose, what's new here in Euro Tier 2018 as far as Alflex are concerned? You have converted your collar into an ear tag. Tell me a bit about that. Yeah, it's a, it's a, gr- it's a great innovation. It's lovely. It's, it's less than 25 grams, um, and, and uh, it, it captures uh, all, all of the data we had before, so basically per, per minute, what's, what's happening with your cows. Uh, it'll give you health alerts, uh, heat detection, uh, and rumination. Uh, and the real new innovation that we're, we're excited about is we can, we can now monitor from, uh, from calf right through uh, the full, full okay. life of the animal. Yeah. We've got the ability to, to, to really understand very quickly if, if you're seeing issues with breathing or coughing, um, and, and can catch uh, early detection. Yeah. From my perspective, out in China, you know, we're we're, we're excited about, you know, we're, we're we're targeting the very large herds there and seeing the huge impacts you can have by spotting mastitis three days before a vet might see it. So uh, it's really improving the efficiency and it's it's the way forward. You know? Is it mainly dairy farmers you're targeting this this device to, or is it pig yeah, farmers as well? Or what's the yeah, we're we're trialing actually a similar product for pig farmers. Um, 
One of the challenges is uh, retention rate, so we've, we've tried to make a smaller one. We're probably about a year, year and a half away from a product launch in that space. So. Okay, yeah. and tell me, the, the challenges for getting business in China now, what's the kind of, what's the biggest challenge in terms of getting your product, in, getting the Allflex product into the hands of Chinese dairy farmers? What's the biggest challenge? Uh, well, well, again, the, the whole global dairy market is in trouble. It's not just uh, low farm prices back in Ireland, uh, in China, they have very high cost, um, and a lot of new farms, so they're heavily indebted. So asking them to make, you know, large uh, capital purchases to say cover 10,000 cows uh, can be a challenge. Uh, but we work with them very closely on the, the, you know, the ROI, the return of investment. Mm. And what we see is that actually it's a seven-year investment that pays itself off within a year. So we've had a good success on that uh, this year. Ian, any insight into what the Galway hurling team are going to do this year? Well, I saw this great win against Kilkenny at the weekend. <laughs> Uh, I my my thing was I didn't go home two years ago to watch the All Ireland. I went home last year and it, it wasn't a good omen. So I'm not going home next year. <laughs> that was Ian Lahif of All Flex ending this report by Jack Kennedy at Eurotier. That's it for this week. Remember, you can read more about all these stories in this week's Irish Farmers Journal and at farmersjournal.ie. You can also keep up to date with all the farming news in our app and on social media. Ferdia Mooney was on sound this week. From me, Thomas Hubert, safe farming and talk to you next week. The Irish Farmers Journal podcast, online at farmersjournal.ie and on iTunes every Thursday.